purpose of this program is to help train you in the safe handling of chemicals. On location, in field camps, and in Duncan and Amarillo. You handle many materials which can become potential hazardous through lack of understanding, abuse, neglect, or lack of common safety precautions. No matter what chemical or hazardous material you're handling, there are two fundamental rules you must recognize. First is that all chemicals can be hazardous. The second is that you must take proper safety precautions when you use, store, or handle any chemical. The basic approach handling all chemicals is that you have to learn the proper respect for them. It's an attitude you take in the interest of your fellow workers, your family, and yourself. There's no room for false heroes here, and no room for horseplay. Not where chemicals and hazardous materials are involved. There's no point in ignoring the fact. Gases, mists, and vapors from certain chemicals can suffocate you. When taken internally or through the skin, chemicals can poison you. They can cause explosions, fires, severe burns, a host of medical problems, including blindness. Now, this doesn't mean that you should be afraid of the chemicals you handle. Just be careful and pay attention to what you're doing. The Chemical Manufacturers Association hit the nail on the head when it says chemicals in any form can be safely stored, handled, and used if their properties are understood and the necessary cautions are observed. Some of the precautions that we'll be looking at are making certain that you're properly dressed for the job, the importance of a safe working area, the identification of the various DOE labels and their meanings, the safe storage of chemicals, you should also know the procedure for cleaning up chemical spill. You should have a knowledge of first aid precautions, as well as general safety information related to the safe handling of chemicals and hazardous materials. You are never ready to handle chemicals until you are properly dressed. This includes eye protection and gloves. Depending on the kind of chemicals you are handling, a complete protective suit may be required. If you are in doubt, at your supervisor. If there's any question, it is better to be overprotected rather than unprotected. It may be necessary for you to wear a respirator. There are several types available, and each is designed for a specific use. Ask your supervisor. He should be able to find out what type you should wear and when you should wear it. All gloves do not afford the same degree of protection. There are several kinds. Your supervisor should be able to direct you as to what type you should be wearing when handling different chemicals. Protective clothing is important, but your best protection against injury when using, handling, or storing chemicals is to avoid any direct contact with them. To avoid injury, always minimize contact. Once you are properly dressed in protective clothing, check your work area. Know the location of emergency showers, eye flushes, and how they operate. Know where the exits, fire extinguishers, and respirators are. If you don't know how to use the fire extinguisher or respirator in your area, ask your supervisor to show you. Housekeeping is very important when working with chemicals. Make sure your work area is clean and free from extraneous articles. You can prevent a fall and a spill if you pick up things such as nails, pieces of wire, and scraps. Clean up any oil, water, or grease that may be on the floor. Before handling any chemicals, you should know the meaning of the DOT labels. These are the diamond-shaped labels that can assist you in the identification of chemicals. Not all chemical containers have DOT or Department of Transportation labels. However, you should be able to identify these containers by the Halibut label or the stenciling. There are basically five groups of chemicals which you must be aware of. They are acids, alkalis, oxidizers, flammables, and poisons. 
All of these chemicals can be in either liquid or solid form. Acids are identified by their Halliburton name and the DT black and white corrosive label. Common acids that we use are Fe1A, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and formic acid. Alkalis are also identified by the DOT corrosive label. Since the DOT labels are the same, there may be some difficulty in differentiating between the acid and alkalis by the label alone. Here again, refer to the Halliburton label, or stenciling. Some of our more common alkalis are caustic flake, or bead, aqueous ammonia, and MO56. Oxidizers will have a yellow DOT label. Some common oxidizers are SP breaker and sodium nitrate. Organic peroxides are also identified by a yellow DOT label. These include such products as HT breaker. Flammable liquids may be identified by the red DOT label. These include such products as Morflow 2 and Rolene 213. There are flammable solids that have a different DO label. Materials which bear these labels are commonly used by Halberton services at this time. You could come across it when handling our chemicals. Poisons are identified by DOT soil and crossbones. Some of our chemicals are definitely poisonous. HAI 50 is a good example. Several of our products will have more than one DOT label. For example, a product can be flammable as well as poisonous, or poisonous as well as corrosive. Always heed the cautions on Halliburton label. If there is no label at all on a chemical container, or if you are unable to read the label, don't try to determine what the chemical is by sniffing it or tasting it. Ask your supervisor to identify the material. Don't ever take the label on any chemical container. If you should put a chemical in a container, always put a label on it. Don't be the culprit behind a serious accident. The safe storage of chemicals is of extreme importance. Acids and alkalis are incompatible. In the event of a combined spill, these two chemicals may cause a violent reaction. They should never be stored together. Oxidizers and flammable or combustible liquids are not compatible and should never be stored together. The indiscriminate mixing of these two materials can result in an immediate fire. Your supervisor's material safety data manuals should help both you and your supervisor in achieving safe chemical storage and handling. Chemical spills can happen at any time, and you should be prepared in knowing what to do. In the event of a spill, the first thing you should do is leave the immediate area. Don't try to clean up the material by yourself. Contact your supervisor. Tell them what happened and warn others to stay out of the area. Here's why. Some of our chemicals give off toxic gases and vapors. Any spills of chemicals marked with the DOT skull and crossbones are especially dangerous. These not only present breathing hazard, but some of our business chemicals can be absorbed through the skin. Dangerous and potentially toxic are large spills in enclosed areas such as inside warehouses or shipping docks, particularly spills of chemicals such as trichloroethane and nitric acid. If the spill is a large quantity of flammable wood, warn others to keep machinery, especially lift trucks, out of the area. A spark here can sell disaster. Immediately contact your supervisor and tell them what spilled and how much. Always report a spill to the supervisor. Reporting the spill is one of the most important responsibilities you have. Before your supervisor can conduct cleanup operations, he must first know what the chemical is and how extensive spill is. Your supervisor will contact the proper 
people to determine the correct cleanup procedure. Normally, the cleanup step should include the proper selection of personal protective equipment that's required for that specific chemical. The neutralizer of small acid and alkali spills. Followed by picking up or removing the neutralized materials. And washing the remaining residue with water. The absorbing of flammables, combustibles, and poisons with sand, vermiculite, sawdust, or dry zip. Your supervisor will obtain the necessary information and determine what sort of material to use. It's important that your supervisor determine the sort of material and neutralizer. Don't take it on yourself to just throw something on a spill to soak it up. Here's why. If you throw on dust on an organic peroxide spill, a violent reaction and fire could result. Different chemicals will have different reactions to the type of absorbent material that's used. If your supervisor assigns you to a small cleanup of dusty or powdered chemicals, make certain that you're properly dressed. Eye protection, the proper respirator if needed, and gloves. Avoid any direct contact with the chemical. Don't walk in the chemical or create dust while sweeping into a disposal container. Toxic, corrosive, volatile, or other hazardous material should never be drained into a public sewage system or carelessly disposed of. A suitable disposal method must be planned. Your supervisor should call the Waste Management Group of the Facility Design and Construction Division in Lincoln. This group can assist in the disposal of hazardous waste. The U.S. Environment Protection Agency and state and local authority have definite and strict requirements for the disposal of chemicals. Safety and first aid are important responsibilities that you have to yourself and your fellow workers. Here are some general first aid tips. If you should get a chemical splash on any part of your body, get to a shower as quickly as possible and remove the contaminated clothing. The main idea is to minimize contact. Remember, the most important thing is water. Then soap and water. After washing, go first aid. If you don't have a first aid attendant, report to your supervisor. Do this even if you feel okay. Don't forget, the immediate washing of the skin with generous amounts of water is the most effective first aid treatment for chemical burn. So be sure that lots of water is available near any place where you use or handle chemicals. The action of most chemicals on the eyes is very rapid. If you get a chemical in your eye, immediately start to flush it out with lots of running water. Flood the eye for at least 15 minutes. No less. If an eye fountain isn't available, use water from a drinking fountain or an open hose or even a bucket filled with water. Acids and chronic chemicals can be extremely dangerous to your eyes. Don't let familiarity breed complacency. Halliburton Services uses thousands of gallons of hydrochloric acid every day. Ah! If you get this acid in your eyes, the severity of injury will depend on how much acid you got in your eyes, concentration of acid, and how long you just let it go before flushing your eyes or getting first aid. The severity will range from redness to complete clouding of the cornea and even loss of the eye. In control laboratory testing, a 20-second contact of extremely weak hydrochloric acid, 1 to 4 percent, has caused scarring of the cornea. Hydrochloric acid is not Halliburton Service's most dangerous chemical to get into one's eyes. This is an example of what sodium hydroxide can do. So always wear gloves and goggles and don't let anyone get away with saying, ah, oh, it's just acid. 
Job situations can vary, and you may find yourself in a position to help rescue another. Industrial cleaning operators, for example, should have an agreed-upon rescue plan before entering any enclosed vessel or space. In general, if a fellow employee overcome by chemical vapors following a spill, get him into the fresh air as soon as possible. But don't ever go into a vapor-filled area to rescue another person without wearing the proper respiratory equipment. Call for help. More than once, a pile of bodies has been the result of a reckless rescue event. Most Halliburton chemicals are not that toxic. However, in a confined space or in some unforeseen situation, many of our chemicals can become extremely dangerous. If the proper respirator is not known, use 30-minute air packs and station an observer with a skin pack outside the area for entering. Employees using any respirator should always be trained in its use. Get the unconscious person into the fresh air. If he isn't breathing, start artificial respiration immediately. Keep him warm and lying down until you get a doctor. Many times a chemical accident requires the services of a doctor. The telephone numbers of a doctor, an ambulance service, the local fire department, and the government Regulation Department in Duncan should be posted on or very near the telephones in areas where chemicals are handled. Different chemicals may require different first aid treatments. For example, if a man has swallowed an acid or an alkali, call a doctor immediately. Give the doctor as much information as you can about what happened and the chemical involved. Keep the material safety data manual handy. The physician may need information from it. Keep the victim lying down and quiet. You may give him up to one quart of water or milk, but do not induce vomiting unless specifically directed to do so by the physician. On the other hand, there are poisons that call for induced vomiting. So always read the Halliburton label and refer to the material safety data manuals. Some practical personal hygiene is called for when working around chemicals. Always walk before lunch and at quitting time, more often if it's needed. Wear clean clothes. Some chemicals are skin or respiratory sensitizers. First time or two you contact them, you have no adverse reaction. However, if contact is frequent and chemicals are not immediately washed off when contact is made, an allergy-like reaction will result. Many times the result is quite severe. Epoxy hardeners cause this problem. It can be avoided if you minimize contact. When you use or handle chemicals, accept responsibility. Look around you every day. Notice potential dangers. Chemical spills, strong odors, leaking valves, or connections in incompatible chemicals stored together all should be corrected immediately or reported to your supervisor. Always know what you're working with and minimize your contact with the chemical. If you need to transfer chemicals from one container to another, use a transfer pump whenever possible. Wherever chemicals are used, handled, or stored, everyone involved has a special responsibility. Don't become careless just because you handle small amounts of chemicals. Always remember that a little spill can be as damaging as a large spill. Be alert. When opening bombs, especially when the top seems to have pressure on it, be sure to wear a face shield and goggles. Gloves and an apron would even be a good idea. Open the bung cautiously. More than once, drums pressured by heat or gas buildup have been opened too fast. Chemicals can sew everywhere. So remember to show the proper respect for chemicals. Recognize that they are hazardous. Take proper precautions and use the proper safeguards. Working with chemicals is a very serious business. All incidents resulting in serious personal injury, death, or substantial property damage should be immediately reported to the legal department claim section in accordance with Halliburton's accident reporting manual. 
chemicals in any form can safely stored and handled. Halliburton Services cares about your health and safety, but you have to do your part. Dress properly for the job. When in doubt about protective equipment, see your supervisor. Read the labels. Understand what you're handling and what its safe uses are. Learn what to do if something should go wrong. Try not to work alone. Always minimize contact with any chemical. Keep your skin and clothes washed clean. And insist on good housekeeping wherever industrial chemicals are used, stored, or handled. Chemicals are an essential part of modern life. They make our lives easier and provide new and better products. Unfortunately, they also present hazards to those who do not handle them properly. Chemicals are also an essential part of the oil well servicing business. And because there are hazards involved with handling these chemicals, it is important that we know the properties of the chemicals we handle and control exposures to them. No and control are the essential elements of chemical safety. Today, increasing concern and attention are being focused on the potential adverse health effects which may occur due to personal exposure to chemical substances in the workplace. Because of this concern, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, known as OSHA, approved a regulation entitled the Hazard Communication Standard. Halliburton Services operations became subject to this regulation on May 23, 1988. Simply stated, this regulation requires all employers to inform and train their employees relative to the chemical hazard in the workplace. Five elements of the hazardous communication program include a written hazard communication program, identification of chemical hazards, proper labeling, material safety data sheets, and employee training. Today we will review these five elements as they relate to our business. Section 17 of the Howerton Safety Manual contains the written hazard communication program, which outlines how we as a company meet standards. Included in the written program is an inventory of all all the chemicals handled in your facility. For the chemicals listed in our inventory, we have material safety data sheets, which will be explained later. To understand the hazards and to control exposures, we must know the possible routes the chemical can take to enter the body. A first route of entry is absorption. Chemicals can be absorbed the skin into the bloodstream which affects other parts of the body. The skin is the largest organ of the body, and consequently, contact hazards are the greatest occupational health injury reported. An example of a chemical which can be absorbed to the skin is HAI-65 corrosion inhibitor, which may result in central nervous system damage. The second major route is inhalation. Inhalation chemicals provides the quickest route of entry into the body. The lungs exchange chemicals to bloodstream, which are immediately carried throughout the body. Examples of the inhalation route are dust, vapors, mist, and gases from various chemicals. The next route of entry is by injection. Chemicals can be injected into the body by high pressure streams of air or fluids. Because of this, the shop air compressor should not be used to remove dust from clothing or the body. 
and Jefferson is last route. Although it is an unlikely industrial route of entry, this occurs when you have chemicals on your hands, neglect good personal hygiene before you eat or smoke. To summarize, a chemical often has more than one route of entry. Understanding the various routes of entry of a specific chemical material is important in determining health effects of the chemical and controlling the exposures. That covers the route of exposure. Let's take our first break here. When we come back, we'll take a look at identifying the hazard. To identify the hazard, you must not only know the routes of exposure, but you must also know the forms in which chemicals contact the body. The forms can be classified as solids, liquids, or gases. Solids are particles which include dust, smoke, fumes, which differ in particle size. Liquids are free-flowing fluids and mist which are airborne liquid droplets. Gases are fluids that have neither independent shape nor volume and tend to expand indefinitely. Gases include vapors, which are materials suspended in air that are normally in the liquid state at room temperature. It is important to know the form of the chemical to control exposures. Different types of engineering controls and protective equipment are required for each type of chemical form. The final step in identifying the hazard is classifying the chemical hazards. Hazards can be classified to two categories, physical hazards and health hazards. Physical hazards can be further subdivided to two categories, fire and reaction. Fire hazards include solids, liquids, and gases. Let's go over some terms that will be helpful to know. Flammables are those chemicals that can be easily ignited. Examples of flammable materials are CL18 crosslinker and HAI75 corrosion inhibitor. Combustible materials are those that can be ignited but take greater temperatures to burn. An example of a combustible material is N88 additive. Burning, the rapid oxidation of a fuel by an oxidizer, usually air, with the liberation of heat and usually light. The process of burning involves three interrelated components, fuel, oxidizer, and an ignition source. These three components make up the fire triangle, and a fire can only be initiated when sufficient energy is present. Likewise, the fuel and oxidizer must be present in proper proportions. The fuel is normally present in the form of a gas or vapor, but even finely divided mist and solids can burn. To control or extinguish fires, any one of the three components must be removed from the fire triangle. Reactive chemicals are materials which react violently, releasing heat and or gases at rates too rapid to be dissipated safely. Thus, reaction is out of control, and either the container bursts, an explosion occurs, toxic vapors and or flammable gases are uncontrollably released or a spontaneous reaction occurs. Explosives are materials which under conditions of shock, elevated temperatures, or chemical reaction decompose violently and rapidly release large quantities of gases and heat. Oxidizing agents react with reducing agents and combustible materials giving off enough oxygen and heat to sustain a fire. Some materials may react with water. Fe1A acidizing composition is an example of a material which will react with water in confined containers, giving off enough gas to rupture the container and enough heat to ignite itself. Other materials react with oxygen in the air, bursting into 
flame. Acid, such as hydrochloric acid, and strong bases, such as caustic soda, react violently with each other. To control reactive materials, store them separately from each other. For instance, keep acids and bases separate and store oxidizers away from flammable or combustible materials. Always add acids or bases to water. Never add water to concentrated solutions of acid or bases. And finally, read the material safety data sheets carefully and note incompatible chemicals. Some chemicals present health hazards to various parts of the body. Corrosive materials are acids, such as hydrochloric acid, and bases, such as caustic soda, which cause severe burns to body tissue. A corrosive material is one that eats away surfaces it contacts, whether it is metal containers, eyes, or skin. Corrosive can be in the form of liquids or solids, and in addition to cause severe burns to eyes and skin, acids and bases can also be reacted with each other or with water if not mixed properly. To control corrosive materials, wear proper protective equipment. While loading acid, wear chemical protective suits, rubber gloves, boots, acid gas respirators, goggles, and face shields. Whenever possible, use pumps or closed systems rather than open pouring to transfer concentrated solutions of corrosive materials. Irritants are materials which affect the eyes, skin, or respiratory system, but does not do permanent damage to tissue. The reaction may be in the form of redness, rash, or allergic sensitization. Irritants include materials such as potassium chloride and cement. Toxic chemicals are those materials which are poisonous or destructive to body's internal systems. Toxicity of a chemical is the potential for injury or illness that it can cause. Some chemicals are more toxic than others. However, even very toxic materials can be handled safely if the proper procedures are followed. Conversely, if a less toxic material is handled laxly, the hazard may be just as high. The toxicity of chemicals are usually referred to in terms of acute or chronic. Acute toxic effects result from a short-term overexposure. Many acute effects are mild, such as irritation and slight dizziness. However, some chemicals have more severe acute effects, such as coma or even death. Chronic toxic effects result from long-term exposure to toxic chemicals. Compared to acute, chronic effects are more subtle. They often occur from low-level exposures over long periods of time. Some chemicals affect the body organs, such as the liver, kidney, lungs, or brain, over long-term overexposure. An example of a chronic toxic effect is silicosis, a disabling lung disease, which results from long-term, usually months or years, of overexposure to crystalline silica. In general, control of toxic chemicals is achieved by minimizing contact with the material using engineering controls such as ventilation systems and enclosed handling systems. When engineering controls are not sufficient, protective equipment such as respirators and gloves should be worn. Now that we've covered how to identify chemical hazards, let's take our second break. Next, we'll look at proper labeling, material safety data sheets, and employee training. There are two major sources for information about chemical hazards, product labels and material safety data sheets. Labels provide immediate information about the contents of a container. It must always be legible and in English. A chemical container must be properly labeled with the following information. The name of the chemical. This name must be the same name that is found on the material safety data sheet. The name, 
address and emergency phone number of the chemical manufacturer or other responsible party. Physical and health hazard associated with the chemical and state procedures, fire action, protective equipment, and spill or leak action. Our labels also include container disposition, the amount of the contents, part number of the chemical, and many products will contain the required DOT transportation label. An additional label may be on the container. The NFPA has a marking system which is color-coded and indexed based on the potential hazards of the chemical material. The colors are blue for health, red for flammability, yellow for reactivity, and white for special precautions. The numerical index system ranges from 0 to 4, with 4 being the highest potential for hazard. Material safety data sheets provide more detailed information than a label. The right to know standard requires the manufacturer to provide the MSDS to a buyer. In addition, the MSDS must be on location where the chemical material is being used and must be available to all employees. Our MSDS contains 11 sections, product description, component information, physical data, fire and explosion data, health hazard data, reactivity, spill or leak procedures, special protection information, special precautions, transportation information, and environmental evaluation. Additionally, the top of page one contains the date printed, revised date, chemical name, and name, address, and telephone number of the manufacturer. Always use the MSDS the latest date. Section one, product description, gives the part number, local code, packet quantity, application, and service used. Section 2 contains component information with each chemical material listed by percent composition. Also, the threshold limit value, PLV, OSHA permissible exposure limit, PEL, toxicity data are printed. The TLVs and PELs are exposure limits are considered safe for an eight-hour period, 40 hours per week, for a working lifetime. Physical data is contained in Section 3. This includes appearance, odor, specific gravity, bulk density, pH, solubility in water, biodegradability, percent volatile, evaporation rate, vapor density, vapor pressure, boiling point, pour point, and freeze point. All physical data is useful. Specific gravity gives the ratio of the chemical material to water. If the specific gravity is less than one, the chemical material will float on water. And if greater than one, the chemical material will sink. The vapor density is the ratio of gas to air. If the vapor density is less than one, the chemical will rise and if greater than one, the chemical material will hug low, lying to ground. Section 4 contains fire and explosion data. The flashpoint is the minimum temperature in which there are enough vapors to ignite but not burn continuously. The auto-ignition temperature is the temperature in which a vapor may ignite without a spark or flame. The flammable limit is the amount of vapor concentration in the air that will burn with an ignition source. Vapor concentrations less than the lower explosive limit are too lean to burn, and vapor concentrations greater than the upper explosive limit are too rich to burn. Each fire hazard for each chemical material varies. Therefore, the extinguishing media, special firefighting procedures, and an unusual fire and explosion hazard should be reviewed in case of fire. The health has data is contained in section 5. A statement is given concerning the carcinogenic potential of the material according to organizations recognized as authorities in the field. 
the product toxicity data gives information concerning the product potential as an irritant or toxin as determined by laboratory tests. The effect and symptoms of exposure are given in this section along with the emergency and first aid procedures. Section 6 contains reactivity data. This section provides information concerning stability, conditions to avoid, incompatibilities, hazardous decomposition products, and hazardous polymerization. Section 7, spill or leak procedures, gives steps to be taken if the material is released or spilled in the proper waste disposal method. Special protection information is contained in Section 8. This area should be reviewed for appropriate respiratory protection, type of ventilation required, protective gloves, eye protection, and other protective equipment. Section 9, titled Special Precautions, provides precautionary level information, part number, handling and storage information, and container disposition. Transportation information is in Section 10 and provides the separate agencies' requirements for shipping labels, reportable quantities, and appropriate shipping containers. Section 11 contains information concerning environmental evaluation. The MSDS contains a vast quantity of information about a chemical material. It should be your primary source of information about the chemicals at your location. When it comes to safety with chemicals, it is your right and responsibility to know the hazards involved with the chemicals used in your workplace and control exposures with the use of proper handling procedures and protective equipment. Know and control the keys to chemical safety.